So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, things that I've been doing during the last uh, years, uh, not in Skoltec, which is I just got here a couple of months ago, but things that I did in Michigan and in Barcelona. So first of all, uh, yes, we do robotics. And let me try to motivate a little the um, why we are talking about dynamic environments. So imagine this crossing. Um, this is the Shibuya crossing in Tokyo. This is the busiest uh, in the world. So there are thousands of interactions happening at the same time. All these, uh, all these people are able to cross from one side to the other, while at the same time not colliding with everyone. And we do this like naturally. We don't think too much, right? So there's someone talking with a mobile and doing other things. So the motivation for us on robotics is, can we do this uh, with a robot? And once you start uh, studying the problem, one realizes that the, this, this task is very complex. So we have a, a not just perception problem, but also a planning problem where all these um, uh, interactions are taking place. We need to decide and we, do, we need to do this in real time, right? So we don't want to deploy robots and being colliding with people. So this is one of the limitations that we currently have. So this is a very used planner, the dynamic window approach, basically treats obstacles just as a static obstacles. What's the advantage? That it's much easier just to plan things, and, and yes, you can um, make your robot move, but the problem is that once you start adding like dynamic constraints like this one, it's not really able to, do, to deliver a good plan, right? So this is just for a motivation. Um, what do we need to include then? So of course, we need to think on these dynamic obstacles, uh, so we need a uh, prediction. Uh, these are the things that I think I consider important for this dynamic environment. So prediction is one of them, not treating things as a static, right? So when you start thinking on prediction, the complexity grows. Uh, another important thing is once you have this prediction of how the environment or all these agents are going to move, uh, we need to uh, provide a couple solution with planning. That means that both prediction and planning have to be like going on the same direction. Uncertainty is very important. So we have seen that uh, detection and the uh, rates for, for classifying pedestrians are high, but still we don't really know what's going to happen. So although you can detect people, it's hard to say when they are just going to cross over your robot and hurt themselves or hurt the robot, or they are just uh, walking um, naturally. So that's, that's, that's actually one of our biggest problems. And not just that, but we want to uh, execute all these plans uh, in real time, right? Because it doesn't matter if you can provide the optimal solution if, if you need say 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, the environment has changed and all these robot plants are useless. So this is the highlight of the presentation. I'll be talking a little on all these uh, issues, right? So let's start by the motion prediction. Um, this is a complete field. I'm not really jumping there, but um, uh, there have been proposed many models. So I'm just using one, which is called the social force model. It's very appealing because uh, it's treating people just as point, as, as two-dimensional points, and the um, trajectory is described by these points depend on forces, right? So the idea is simple. You just get an attraction force. Um, that means you try to get to a goal. There are several goals we need to estimate, which is the most likely one. And then there are other forces that um, for instance, are the interaction with other pedestrians or interaction with uh, another obstacles that are determining this trajectory. So what we did for robots, and that's, that's um, part of the work, uh, we were uh, quantifying which is the interaction that this robot in particular is doing to the pedestrian. The thing is we cannot really treat, that's what we tried to do at the beginning, we cannot really treat robots with the same uh, parameters as other uh, people because, of course, uh, they have different um, dynamic um, conditions. They are bigger, some of them are, are smaller. So really, the interaction that they exert on, 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 this, uh, on, the people, on, on the person that we want to predict is different. 
So we were just observing data and, and fitting the parameters. Uh, with this, uh, the formula, it's very easy. Um, there's superposition on all these forces and you just need to sum all of them. So it's a simple model. So what happens when you just have a trajectory and you are kind of estimating where are you going? So for this particular uh, agent, it just tries to reach this destination. Now what happens when we add like a second agent into the scene? Well, the trajectories change slightly. And for us that was very important because this model is very fast to calculate and somehow we needed to uh, capture this interaction. So now we have a trajectory that is predicting the, the future, but not just that, but we are also able to capture these interactions. So with this, um, we tried that on the robot and we were just recording data and trying to feed what we thought that was going to happen and what actually happened. So we were here in this, 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 this is the Barcelona University campus and we were around. So as you see, we can see the predictions on these green ellipses and well, there's, there's a result that I want to discuss a little. So you see the blue line that decays very, very quickly. Uh, this is when you don't consider a long-term prediction, when you don't consider that the agent is going somewhere, where you just update, you just observe the trajectory of someone, keep velocity and position as your state, and you just propagate that linearly. When you do that, which is, by the way, what most approaches are doing, so when you do that, it's fine for a short period of time. You see just one second and two seconds. You can really predict very accurately where are you going to be in the future. But as time goes on, these predictions become like degraded very quickly. So that's why we need to uh, estimate uh, goals and then apply all this interaction. So we have a model now for predicting what's going to happen. Still, we are interested in robots, right? So we want m things to move and, and we want to test this on robots. So the next step was, okay, can we just try to propose a navigation strategy based on, on this? And the most straightforward uh, solution that we found is, okay, we are gonna use the same extended social force model, but now it will be centered at the robot. That means that this approach is totally reactive. There's no plan, we just uh, center at the robot all these forces. We know, of course, where we are going to go because there's a global plan that is telling us which are these local goals. And then the most important thing is we are, we are gonna avoid all the potential obstacles, dynamic or static, uh, just using the interaction forces. We need to leverage all these contributions from we want to reach the goal, but at the same time we don't want to, uh, we want to avoid other pedestrians and we want to avoid obstacles, static obstacles of course, so we need these um, parameters. And well, um, we tried this again on the campus. The results were fine. Um, as you can imagine, a reactive approach has many problems. It's very fast, it can capture the environment, but really it's not providing a good solution, especially for the long term. So you can find like uh, situations where you can get trapped, right? These are local minima, so um, yes, it has some advantages, but not all of them. So yeah. You see the problem, so the robot on this, it cannot really escape. There's no good plan, and that's, that's something that we cannot, I mean, that's not a good plan. So we keep, we kept doing, doing things, that's good. Um, I'm gonna talk a little more about that later, but, but what is the next uh, logical step, right? So we are just taking a reactive approach, that means there's no planning over time, so let's just plan ahead and we will forward propagate all these trajectories up to some horizon time, and maybe we, we can get better results, right? So that's kind of the idea. So now um, we need to generate paths. Um, I'm gonna show you a video of the environment, how these paths are generated. But the idea is the same. We want to reach a goal, and we are gonna um, calculate many, many of these paths. So you will see here in this environment, for instance, we want to reach this uh, destination, which is the cylinder, blue cylinder, and we are just planning up to some horizon. And every of these blue lines is just a path. 
Um, we need to randomize a little because if there's no other interaction, it will be always the same line. So we want different solutions. And this only makes sense when you start adding like other uh, pedestrians. So if you see here, when there are other pedestrians, not all blue lines uh, are um, equally good. So among all of them, we are choosing which is the best one, the ones that uh, gets our robot closer, not interacting too much with the other uh, agents. So it's exactly the same uh, prediction um, scheme that I showed you before, just to generate one of the blue branches that you have seen. Right, so just for, we, for, for one blue branch, you see here the robot. What we are gonna do is um, we are just gonna try to reach, maintaining all the kinodynamic constraints of the robot. That is, uh, basically we have wheels, and that means that we cannot slip or, or move um, perpendicular to the wheel direction. So that's, well, just a transition function, not really uh, nothing else, but then once we move, we propagate all the environment. And this environment is dependent not just on, on all, all the other agents, but it's dependent on the branch that we have just calculated. So every branch that we are calculating here is slightly different from the other one, right? It makes the prediction slightly different. And basically, with this, we are capturing what's gonna happen uh, if the robot moves this way. So that, that's very important because at the end, it's not just about getting to this point, but it's also important not to hit someone, which might be potentially dangerous. Imagine if you are in a car, a uh, collision, it's not really a good thing. Still on a small robot, it's not a good thing. So yes, imagine this, this sequence of, of robot poses is just one branch. We had several of them. And we choose, uh, we choose the best one. So we are perturbing all these initial configurations just by providing different goals. That is where these branches are going to extend. So you see all these red dots are this extension. If there's no one here, we don't really care. We can focus on trying to get as fast as possible to the goal. If there are other pedestrians, then you can um, wide your uh, the distribution of these, of these goals and then you, you will have more diversity on the paths that you can calculate. So we tried that on, a, on the robot that you've seen. Now uh, it's reactive to the environment and it's also not subject to the local minima problems as we found before. So those are good things. Um, well, late, I will talk a little about the problems about this. So basically one of the main problems is that all these predictions, although we are adding a diffusion process on where we think this uh, pedestrian is going to be, it's a little limited. So um, we cannot really deal with this approach. We cannot really deal well with this unexpected behavior, like someone jumping in front of your robot and things like that. But at least with this, we are um, checking two of the points that we um, commented at the beginning, which is prediction and adjoint planning. So, oh, then I move on. The robot became a little smaller. Uh, this was, I mean, the previous robot was in Barcelona. It was a Segway. And this, this was uh, a smaller robot that we were working on in Michigan. This robot is specially meant for outdoors, but still we, want to, we wanted to navigate in indoor environments or in environments with dynamic environments. That is other people. So the approach is a little different. We are now more interested in the uncertainty of the environment and real-time execution. So to do that, we need to give up on some things. We cannot calculate all the trajectories for all the possible predictions. That's uh, not tractable. And what we did is we just uh, limited the number of plans that we are going to evaluate, but we are going to evaluate more intensely. So that means that uh, instead of having multiple paths, as, as I showed before, we will have fewer of them, but they will be uh, closed loop policies. And I'm going to explain you in a minute what they are. So we have less plans to evaluate, but we need to evaluate them more intensely. So what we uh, call here as policies are these ones, the go solo. It's simply propagating its state and it's trying to reach its goal. It's exactly the same as the reactive approach that we show at the beginning. So we know that there are some problems, right? Um, 
we have another policy which is just stop. This is common sense, right? You see a robot uh, that is navigating, it should stop at some point. So there's just a whole dedicated uh, policy to stopping, right? So you need to get your state into zero velocity. And we, we had another one for very clutter environments, which is follow, which is basically let other agents solve your problem for you. So you are just copying or adapting to the velocity of the other agents that, is, that are on your way, and then you will avoid uh, collisions. So among, among these three very easy policies, we were switching, and we need to find which is the most convenient one at every time. And we, have to do th we need to do this very fast. So um, to do that, we were using sampling. And instead of just propagating all the environment with central moments, like you are estimating position velocity and you propagate them with your prediction system, what we are doing is slightly changing all the initial conditions of all these agents. Because who knows, maybe someone decides just to jump in front of you or do things that are potentially dangerous and we want to perturb all these initial conditions just to be robust to all these changes. So we um, sample over this and then we evaluate what's going to happen if we were executing these very simple uh, closed loop policies. Right? So after that, there's a cost function that we are evaluating and we choose simply which is the, the best according to well, an expectation. So the evaluation of the trajectories, um, there are two um, costs that are actually um, opposed, right? One is uh, you want your robot to reach a goal. That's obvious. The second one is you don't really want to inconvenience other agents. The extreme of this, inconvenient other agents, means hitting them, right? So what happens if you are very, uh, you just want to reach the goal and, and the first objective is the only one that you are following, that this is literally a greedy uh, strategy and you might go hitting some of the things. The second one, the extrema is, okay, you are just like very afraid of everyone and you try to circle around all, <laughs> all the agents in this sense. So there's a trade-off here and, and we are simply interested in, in knowing where, where is the most efficient one. So, the interesting thing is that some emergent behaviors uh, rise after this, so you can very quickly change from one uh, policy to the other, right? So this is, this is the problem that we showed before, but with a different robot. Uh, you remember the big robot, it was stopping because there was someone just in front of its way and couldn't find a, a, um, a path. This is exactly the same problem. So the robot is here, it tries to get through this wall of legs, there's no path and it's just turning around like very stupidly and probably it's gonna hit something. I don't know if I cut that. Oh yeah, it's not hitting but almost. So what happens when this emergent behavior uh, arises? So you can combine now, uh, stopping and just moving. And, and that's surprisingly powerful. This combination of the two things is very powerful. Okay, so the video is playing a little strangely, but okay. I'm going to show you more examples now. So this, this is another um, behavior that we observe. It's trying to follow one agent, then it switches to the other one because it's more convenient to follow the other one, and then it might change to uh, just navigating uh, independently. This is just it's trying to navigate, but there's this... Um, oh. You cannot see it this well. Yeah, so this one, for instance, the person was almost trying to um, jump in front of the robot, but it detected in time and it stopped. So that was also a good one. And well, basically, you get the idea. The, this combination makes, although it's very simple and, and, and there are problems with every of these policies individually, you can get very uh, strong behaviors at the end. So just pushing a little forward, what we found is that, yes, we are more robust to this um, perturbation of the initial conditions, but still sampling is a little limited. So depending on the number of your agents that you have, you might have like uh, not enough samples to exactly hit those configurations that are going to be um, problematic. 
right? So for one agent, it might be okay, but the moment that you have two agents like this, some of the times the robot is not able to see that, hey, there's this small configuration that it's gonna be like very problematic. The cost here is gonna peak in, in and, and sometimes it cannot hit it because there's no uh, particle there. So that was a problem. So what we did is we thought that instead of just sampling, we need to find these height influential uh, configurations. And the idea is, okay, we were just uh, approximating the expectation by some um, samples. What we are gonna do now is forget about that and we are just going to do maximization over this cost function. So it's not really um, go or the most likely configuration because typically this distribution is wide so you might not find these little peaks but it's going to be about uh, optimizing over this uh, product of the probability distribution of the initial configurations for all the agents and the cost function that you get after executing your, your, your policy. So with this uh, influential, it means that it's likely that it's going to happen, but we are especially interested in this height cost. And this function looks very picky. So it's, it's on these peaks is narrow, and we really need to find this. So, well, the idea is we slightly perturb all these um, configurations. Uh, we were using, imagine all this uh, prediction as a network. We were just doing back probe over it and then with that we were doing the optimization. We, we, we had the gradient and the results are uh, look very promising. So you see here on top is the same video that I was showing before all the problems that the robot was not able to sense that that configuration could be um, problematic until very late when it was obvious that it was hitting some, something. And here on the bottom it's exactly the same experiments. We were trying to repeat this as with, with as much fidelity as possible. And well, m all the times mo we were able to, to we, we, which was a very uh, positive result, we were able just to predict that, yeah, this configuration could be potentially dangerous, so it's better to do other policies, like stopping or doing other things. Oh, and this is a video more of open, uh, pedestrians moving here in this environment. It looks a little, right? So it's, now it's not a repeatable experiment, but it's meant to be like all these people are just wandering around and the robot tries to reach one point and it still performed very well. We were trying to invite not people very used to robots like these guys, but other like this lady. So, yeah. So that was all my talk. I hope that um, you, oh, it's going back. That you like it. Thanks for the attention. If you have other questions, you can also look for more uh, material here in our webpage. Uh, you can contact me if you are more interested in doing things with robots. My idea is to keep studying on these things. Also, the perception is a very important part of robotics nowadays. I, I didn't talk about this, but um, it's one of the bottlenecks too. So it's not just how complex the environment is, how these pedestrians or these dynamic agents are behaving, but also how are you perceiving them and how are you treating them. So all these things are... Um, on our list of interesting research topics. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes. What was the point of those random goals? So if you concentrate all your samples on the same area, you might not get different enough trajectories. So that's good when there's nothing, when you have a clear line, but when there are many, many agents, you want to have more variety on your trajectories, on your solutions. And maybe one of them 
it's going to be like really useful. You don't really know. But, but the thing is that sometimes the straight, the straight solution might not be good. So you want to diversify all your trajectories. Yeah, that was the reason. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us more about this search instead of expected something? What is a X subscript zero? Um, um, these are the initial configurations of all the agents. So here, imagine you have a vector consisting of all these states. Uh, for every agent, its position and velocity. Right? And you have this is the dimensionality of these grows depending on how many agents you are considering. So it might be, I don't know, for two agents, it might be eight variables, 10 agents, 40. So yeah, that's it. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Does this thing, uh, like, uh, does this thing uh, try to avoid the worst outcome or something like that? Um, it tries to find the best one, <laughs> which is the same, but just formulated a little differently. Yes, so definitely all the outcomes that might be dangerous, you don't want to execute them. That's not a good practice. So we are just trying to leverage that. If we see that if there's a configuration that it's going to be problematic, it's going to hit something, then the policy selected is a stop. <laughs>